It's a gray, cold day over here, so perfect to read something really British. And I am British, so I'm allowed to make fun a bit. And it just doesn't get more British than P.G. Woodhouse, not Woodhouse, Woodhouse, and his Jeeves and Worcester stories. Now, this has to come with a disclaimer that Woodhouse is a problematic writer. How can I put this? Culturally, the British ruling class, the upper class, the public school kids that seem to go straight from Eton to Westminster, have defended themselves with what George Orwell called an impenetrable stupidity, and with that, a kind of nostalgia for the past, especially the past of a rigid class system. Well, if you just act stupid enough, then you don't have to acknowledge the corruption, the systematic inequality that maintains you in the position you're in. And you certainly don't have to acknowledge the suffering of the people who've been ground underfoot. In the extreme case, you can even use that callousness to show off your class position. Look how little I care about the little people. That shows how great and old-fashioned and upper class I am. Well, in any case, unfortunately, the bucolic, gentle nostalgia of Woodhouse just plays right into that, even though the author himself seems to have been kind of like his own stories, very genial and kind, well-meaning, a little naive. And this came to a head in 1940. He was living in France when the Germans swept through and took over. He was taken to an internment camp, and then the secret police let him out of the internment camp so that he could do non-political radio broadcasts for the Germans, which of course got turned into Nazi propaganda. He got into a lot of trouble for this afterwards, and he always regretted it, but the terms in which he regretted it, he said, oh, what an ass I was, how silly I was. You know, that's, that's pretty light terminology to talk about collaborating with the Gestapo. Well, in any case, I think we have to acknowledge this and use that not to get carried too far into the wrong kind of nostalgia, but he still is a wonderful author and a sweet guy, and I think you should be allowed to settle into his stories, like into a nice hot cup of tea, which I also have here. So we are going to read The Inimitable Jeeves, and I'm not going to read the whole book. Each uh, chapter is kind of a short story, so let's do a chapter or two. Chapter one. Mm. Jeeves exerts the old cerebellum. Morning, Jeeves, I said. Good morning, sir, said Jeeves. He put the good old cup of tea softly on the table by my bed, and I took a refreshing sip, just right as usual. Not too hot, not too sweet, not too weak, not too strong, not too much milk, and not a drop spilled in the saucer. Most amazing cove, Jeeves. So dashed competent in every respect. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I mean to say, just take one small instance. Every other valet I've ever had used to barge into my room in the morning while I was still asleep, causing much misery. But Jeeves seems to know when I'm awake by a sort of telepathy. He always floats in with the cup exactly two minutes after I come to life. Makes a deuce of a lot of difference to a fellow's day. How's the weather, Jeeves? Exceptionally clement, sir. Anything in the papers? Some slight friction threatening in the Balkans, sir. Otherwise nothing. I say, Jeeves, a man I met at the club last night told me to put my shirt on privateer for the two o'clock race this afternoon. How about it? I should not advocate it, sir. The stable is not sanguine. That was enough for me. Jeeves knows. How I couldn't say, but he knows. There was a time when I would laugh lightly and go ahead and lose my little all against his advice, but not now. Talking of shirts, I said, have those mauve ones I ordered arrived yet? Yes, sir. I sent them back. Sent them back? Yes, sir. They would not have become you. Well, I must say, I thought fairly highly of those shirtings, but I bowed to superior knowledge. Weak? I don't know. Most fellows, no doubt, are all for having their valets confine their activities to creasing trousers and whatnot without trying to run the house. But it's different with Jeeves. Right from the first day he came to me, I have looked on him as a sort of guide, philosopher, and friend. Mr. Little rang up on the telephone a few moments ago, sir. I informed him that you were not yet awake. Did he leave a message? No, sir. He mentioned that he had a matter of importance to discuss with you, but confided no details. Oh, well, I expect I shall be seeing him at the club. No doubt, sir. I wasn't what you might call in a fever of impatience. Bingo Little is a chap I was at school with, and we see a lot of each other still. He's the nephew of old Mortimer Little, who retired from business recently with a goodish pile. You've probably heard of Little's liniment. It limbers up the legs. 
Bingo biffs about London on a pretty comfortable allowance given him by his uncle and leads on the whole a fairly unclouded life. It wasn't likely that anything which he described as a matter of importance would turn out to be really so frightfully important. I took it that he had discovered some new brand of cigarette which he wanted me to try or something like that and didn't spoil my breakfast by worrying. After breakfast I lit a cigarette and went to the open window to inspect the day. It certainly was one of the best and brightest. Jeeves, I said. Sir, said Jeeves. He had been clearing away the breakfast things, but the sound of the young master's voice cheesed it courteously. You are absolutely right about the weather. It is a juicy morning. Decidedly, sir. Spring and all that. Yes, sir. In the spring, Jeeves, a livelier iris gleams upon the burnished dove. So I have been informed, sir. Righto. Then bring me my wangy, my yellowest shoes, and the old green Hornberg. I'm going into the park to do pastoral dances. I don't know if you know that sort of feeling you get on these days round about the end of April and the beginning of May, when the sky's a light blue with cotton wool clouds and there's a kind of breeze blowing from the west. Kind of an uplifting feeling. Romantic, if you know what I mean. I'm not much of a ladies' man, but on this particular morning it seemed to me that what I really wanted was some charming girl to buzz up and ask me to save her from assassins or something. So it was a bit of an anticlimax when I merely ran into young Bingo Little, looking perfectly foul in a crimson satin tie decorated with horseshoes. "'Hello, Bertie,' said Bingo. "'My God, man!' I gargled. "'The cravat! The gent's neckwear! Why? For what reason?' "'Oh, the tie!' he blushed. I, uh, I was given it. He seemed embarrassed, so I dropped the subject. We toddled along a bit and sat down on a couple of chairs by the serpentine. Jeeves tells me you want to talk to me about something, I said. Eh? said Bingo with a start. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I waited for him to unleash the topic of the day, but he didn't seem to want to get going. Conversation languished. He stared straight ahead of him in a glassy sort of manner. I say, Bertie, he said after the pause of about an hour and a quarter. Hello. Do you like the name Mabel? No. 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 You don't think there's a kind of music in the word, like the wind rustling gently through the treetops? No. He seemed disappointed for a moment, then cheered up. Of course you wouldn't. You always were a fat-headed worm without a soul, weren't you? Just as you say. Who is she? Tell me all. For I realize now that poor old Bingo was going through it once again. Ever since I've known him, and we were at school together, he's been perpetually falling in love with someone, generally in the spring, which seems to act on him like magic. At school, he had the finest collection of actresses' photographs of anyone of his time, and at Oxford, his romantic nature was a byword. You'd better come along and meet her at lunch, he said, looking at his watch. A ripe suggestion, I said. Where are you meeting her? At the Ritz? Near the Ritz. He was geographically accurate. About 50 yards east of the Ritz, there's one of those blighted tea and bun shops you see dotted about all over London. And into this, if you'll believe me, young Bingo dived like a homing rabbit. And before I had time to say a word, we were wedged in at a table on the brink of a silent pool of coffee left there by an earlier luncher. I am bound to say I couldn't quite follow the development of the scenario. Bingo, while not absolutely rolling in the stuff, had always had a fair amount of the ready. Apart from what he got from his uncle, I knew that he'd finished up the jumping season well on the right side of the ledger. Why, then, was he lunching the girl at this godforsaken eatery? It couldn't be because he was hard up. Just then the waitress arrived, rather a pretty girl. Aren't we going to wait, I started to say to Bingo, thinking it's somewhat thick that, in addition to asking a girl to lunch with him in a place like this, he should fling himself upon the foodstuffs before she turned up when I caught sight of his face and stopped. The man was goggling. His entire map was suffused with a rich blush. He looked like the soul's awakening done in pink. Hello, Mabel, he said with a sort of gulp. Hello, said the girl. Mabel, said Bingo, this is Bertie Wooster, a pal of mine. Pleased to meet you, she said. Nice morning. Fine, I said. You see, I'm wearing the tie, said Bingo. It suits you beautiful, said the girl. Personally, if anybody had told me that a tie like that had suited me, I should have risen and struck them on the mazard, regardless of their age and sex. But poor old Bingo simply got all flustered with gratification and smirked in the most gruesome manner. 
Well, what's it going to be today? asked the girl, introducing the business touch into the conversation. Bingo studied the menu devotedly. I'll have a cup of cocoa, cold veal and ham pie, slice of fruitcake and a macaroon. Same for you, Bertie? I gazed at the man, revolted, that he could have been a pal of mine all these years and think me capable of insulting the old tum with this sort of stuff. Cut me to the quick. Or how about a bit of hot steak pudding with a sparkling limado to wash it down, said Bingo. You know, the way love can change a fellow is really frightful to contemplate. This chappy before me, who spoke in that absolutely careless way of macaroons and lamado, was the man I'd seen in happier days telling the head waiter at Claridge's exactly how he wanted the chef to prepare the sol frito gourmet au champignon, and saying he would jolly well sling it back if it wasn't done just right. Ghastly! Ghastly! A roll and butter and a small coffee seemed the only things on the list that hadn't been specially prepared by the nastier-minded members of the Borgia family for people they had a particular grudge against, so I chose them and Mabel hopped it. Well, said Bingo rapturously, I took it that he wanted my opinion of the female poisoner who had just left us. Very nice, I said. He seemed dissatisfied. You don't think she's the most wonderful girl you ever saw, he said wistfully. Oh, absolutely, I said to appease the blighter. Where did you meet her? At a subscription dance at Camberwell. What on earth were you doing at a subscription dance at Camberwell? Your man Jeeves asked me if I would buy a couple of tickets. It was in aid of some charity or other. Jeeves? I didn't know he went in for that sort of thing. Well, I suppose he has to relax a bit every now and then. Anyway, he was there, swinging a dash at efficient shoe. I hadn't meant to go at first, but I turned up for a lark. Oh, Bertie, think of what I might have missed. What might you have missed? I asked, the old lemon being slightly clouded. Mabel, you chump. If I hadn't gone, I shouldn't have met Mabel. Oh, ah. At this point, Bingo fell into a species of trance and only came out of it to wrap himself round the pie and macaroon. Bertie, he said, I want your advice. Carry on. At least, not your advice, because that wouldn't be much good to anybody. I mean, you're a pretty consummate old ass, aren't you? Not that I want to hurt your feelings, of course. No, no, I see that. What I wish you would do is put the whole thing to that fellow Jeeves of yours and see what he suggests. You've often told me that he's helped other pals of yours out of messes. From what you tell me, he's by way of being the brains of the family. He's never let me down yet. Then put my case to him. What case? My problem. What problem? Why, you poor fish, my uncle, of course. What do you think my uncle's going to say to all this? If I sprang it on him cold, he'd tie himself in knots on the hearth rug. One of those emotional Johnnies, eh? Somehow or other, his mind has got to be prepared to receive the news. But how? Ah. That's a lot of help, that ah. You see, I'm pretty well dependent on the old boy. If he cut off my allowance, I should be very much in the soup. So you put the whole binge to Jeeves and see if he can't scare up a happy ending somehow. Tell him my future is in his hands, and that if the wedding bells ring out, he can rely on me even onto half my kingdom. Well, call it ten quid. Jeeves would exert himself with ten quid on the horizon. What? Undoubtedly, I said. I wasn't in the least surprised that Bingo wanting to lug Jeeves into his private affairs like this. It was the first thing I would have thought of doing myself if I'd been in a hole of any description. As I have frequently had occasion to observe, he is a bird of ripest intellect, full of bright ideas. If anybody could fix things for old Bingo, it was him. I stated the case to him that night after dinner. Jeeves? Sir? Are you busy just now? No, sir. I mean, not doing anything in particular? No, sir. It is my practice at this hour to read some improving book, but if you desire my services, this can easily be postponed, or indeed abandoned altogether. Well, I want your advice. It's about Mr. Little. Young Mr. Little, sir, or the elder Mr. Little, his uncle, who lives in Pounceby Gardens? Chief seems to know everything. Most amazing thing. I've been pally with Bingo practically all my life, and yet I didn't remember ever having heard that his uncle lived anywhere in particular. How did you know he lived in Pounceby Gardens? I said. I am on terms of some intimacy with the elder Mr. Little's cook, sir. In fact, there is an understanding. I'm bound to say this gave me a bit of a start. Somehow I'd never thought of Jeeves going in for that sort of thing. Do you mean that you're engaged? It may well be said to amount to that, sir. Well, well. She is a remarkably excellent cook, sir, said Jeeves, as though he felt called upon to give some little explanation. 
What is it you wish to ask me about Mr. Little? I sprang the details on him. And that's how the matter stands, Jeeves, I said. I think we ought to rally round a trifle and help poor old Bingo put the thing through. Tell me about old Mr. Little. What sort of chap is he? A somewhat curious character, sir. Since retiring from business, he has become a great recluse and now devotes himself almost entirely to the pleasures of the table. Greedy hog, you mean? I would not perhaps take the liberty of describing him in precisely those terms, sir. He is what is usually called a gourmet, very particular about what he eats, and for that reason sets a high value on Miss Watson's services. The cook? Yes, sir. Well, it looks to me as though our best plan would be to shoot young Bingo on him after dinner one night. Melting mood, I mean to say, and all that. The difficulty is, sir, that at the moment Mr. Little is on a diet owing to an attack of gout. Things begin to look wobbly. No, sir, I fancy that the elder Mr. Little's misfortune may be turned to the younger Mr. Little's advantage. I was speaking only the other day to Mr. Little's valet, and he was telling me that it has become his principal duty to read to Mr. Little in the evenings. If I were in your place, sir, I should send young Mr. Little to read to his uncle. Nephew's devotion, you mean. Old man touched by kindly action, what? Partly that, sir, but I would rely more on young Mr. Little's choice of literature. That's no good. Jolly old Bingo has a kind face, but when it comes to literature, he stops at the sporting times. That difficulty may be overcome. I would be happy to select books for Mr. Little to read. Perhaps I might explain my idea further. I can't say I grasp it quite yet. The method which I advocate, sir, is what I believe the advertisers call direct suggestion, sir, consisting as it does of driving home an idea by constant repetition. You may have had experience of the system. You mean that they keep on telling you that some soap or other is the best, and after a bit you come under the influence and charge round the corner and buy a cake? Exactly, sir. The same method was the basis of all the most valuable propaganda during the last war. I see no reason why it should not be adopted to bring about the desired result with regard to the subject's views on class distinctions. If young Mr. Little were to read day after day to his uncle a series of narratives in which marriage with young persons of an inferior social status was held up as both feasible and admirable, I fancy it would prepare the elder Mr. Little's mind for the reception of the information that his nephew wishes to marry a waitress in a tea shop. Are there books of that sort nowadays? The only ones I ever see mentioned in the papers are about married couples who find life grey and can't stick each other at any price. Yes, sir, there are a great many, neglected by the reviewers, but widely read. You have never encountered All for Love by Rosie M. Banks? No, nor A Red Red Summer Rose by the same author. No. I have an aunt, sir, who owns an almost complete set of Rosie M. Banks. I could easily borrow as many volumes as young Mr. Little might require. They make very light, attractive reading. Well, it's worth trying. I should certainly recommend the scheme, sir. All right, then. Toddle round to your aunt's tomorrow and grab a couple of the fruitiest. We can but have a dash at it. Precisely, sir. Chapter 2. No Wedding Bells for Bingo. Bingo reported three days later that Rosie M. Banks was the goods and beyond the question the stuff to give the troops. Old Little had jibbed somewhat at first at the proposed change of literary diet, he not being much of a lad for fiction and having stuck hitherto exclusively to the heavier monthly reviews. But Bingo had got chapter one of All for Love past his guard before he knew what was happening, and after that there was nothing to it. Since then, they had finished A Red Red Summer Rose, Madcap Myrtle, and Only a Factory Girl, and were halfway through The Courtship of Lord Strathmorlick. Bingo told me all this in a husky voice over an egg beaten up in sherry. The only blot on the thing from his point of view was that it wasn't doing a bit of good for the old vocal cords, which were beginning to show signs of cracking under the strain. He'd been looking his symptoms up in a medical dictionary, and he thought he had got clergyman's throat. But against this, you had to set the fact that he was making an undoubted hit in the right quarter, and also that after the evening's reading, he had always stayed on to dinner, and from what he told me, the dinners turned out by old Little's cook had to be tasted to be believed. There were tears in the old blighter's eyes as he got on the subject of the clear soup. I suppose to a fellow who for weeks has been tackling macaroons and Lamado, it must have been like heaven. Old Little wasn't able to give any practical assistance at these banquets, but Bingo said that he had come to the table and had his whack of arrowroot and sniffed the dishes and told stories of entrees that he had had in the past and sketched out scenarios of what he was going to do with the bill of fare in the future when the doctor put him in shape. So I suppose he enjoyed himself too in a way. 
Anyhow, things seemed to be buzzing along quite satisfactorily, and Bingo said he had got an idea which he thought was going to clinch the thing. He wouldn't tell me what it was, but he said it was a pippin. We make progress, Jeeves, I said. That is very satisfactory, sir. Mr. Little tells me that when he came to a big scene in Only a Factory Girl, his uncle gulped like a stricken bullpup. Indeed, sir. Where Lord Claude takes the girl into his arms, you know, and says, I am familiar with the passage, sir. It is distinctly moving. It was a great favorite of my aunt's. I think we're on the right track. It would seem so, sir. In fact, this looks like being another of your successes. I've always said, and I always shall say, that for sheer brain, Jeeves, you stand alone. All the other great thinkers of the age are simply in the crowd, watching you go by. Thank you very much, sir. I endeavor to give satisfaction. About a week after this, Bingo blew in with the news that his uncle's gout had ceased to trouble him, and that on the morrow he would be back at the old stand, working away with knife and fork as before. And by the way, said Bingo, he wants you to lunch with him tomorrow. Me? Why me? He doesn't know that I exist. Oh, yes, he does. I've told him about you. What have you told him? Oh, various things. Anyway, he wants to meet you. And take my tip, laddie. You go. I should think lunch tomorrow will be something special. I don't know why it was, but even then it struck me that there was something dashed odd, almost sinister, if you know what I mean, about young Bingo's manner. The old egg has the air of someone who has something in his sleeve. There is more in this than meets the eye, I said. Why should your uncle ask a fellow to lunch whom he's never seen? My dear old fathead, haven't I just said that I've been telling him all about you, that you're my best pal at school together and all that sort of thing? But even then, and another thing, why are you so dashed keen on my going? Bingo hesitated for a moment. Well, I told you I'd got an idea. This is it. I want you to spring the news on him. I haven't the nerve myself. What? I'm hanged if I do. And you call yourself a pal of mine? Yes, I know, but there are limits. Bertie, said Bingo reproachfully, I saved your life once. When? Didn't I? It must have been some other fellow then. Well, anyway, we were boys together and all that. You can't let me down. Oh, all right, I said. But when you say you haven't nerve enough for any dashed thing in the world, you misjudge yourself. A fellow who... Cheerio, said young Bingo. One thirty tomorrow. Don't be late. I am bound to say that the more I contemplated the binge, the less I liked it. It was all very well for Bingo to say that I was slated for a magnificent lunch, but what good is the best possible lunch to a fellow if he's slung out into the street on his ear during the soup course? However, the word of a Worcester is his bond, and all that sort of rot. So at 1.30 the next day, I tottered up the steps of number 16, Pounceby Gardens, and punched the bell. And half a minute later, I was up in the drawing room, shaking hands with the fattest man I have ever seen in my life. The motto of the Little family is apparently variety. Young Bingo is long and thin and hasn't had a superfluous ounce on him since we first met, but the uncle restored the average and a bit over. The hand which grasped mine wrapped it round and enfolded it till I began to wonder if I'd ever get it out without excavating machinery. Mr. Worcester, I am gratified, I am proud, I am honored. It seemed to me that young Bingo must have boosted me to some purpose. Oh, ah, uh, I said. He stepped back, still hanging on to the good right hand. You are very young to have accomplished so much. I couldn't follow the train of thought. The family, especially my Aunt Agatha, who has savaged me incessantly from childhood up, have always rather made a point of the fact that mine is a wasted life, and that since I won the prize at my first school for the best collection of wildflowers made during the summer holidays, I haven't done a damn thing to land me on the nation's scroll of fame. I was wondering if he couldn't have got me mixed up with someone else when the telephone bell rang outside in the hall and the maid came in to say that I was wanted. I buzzed down and found that it was young Bingo. Hello, said young Bingo. So you've got there. Good man, I knew I could rely on you. I say, old crumpet, did my uncle seem pleased to see you? Absolutely all over me. I can't make it out. Oh, that's all right. I just rang up to explain. The fact is, old man, I know you won't mind, but I've told him that you were the author of those books I've been reading to him. What? Yes, I said that Rosie M. Banks was your pen name, and you don't want it generally known because you're a modest, retiring sort of chap. He'll listen to you now. Absolutely hang on your words. A brightish idea, what? I doubt if Jeeves in person could have thought of a better one than that. Well, pitch it strong, old lad, and keep it steadily before you, the fact that I must have my allowance raised. I can't possibly marry on what I've got now. 
If this film is to end with a slow fade out on the embrace, at least double is indicated. Well, that's that. Cheerio. And he rang off. At that moment, the gong sounded and the genial host came tumbling downstairs like the delivery of a ton of coals. I always look back to that lunch with a sort of aching regret. It was the lunch of a lifetime and I wasn't in a fit state to appreciate it. Subconsciously, if you know what I mean, I could see it was pretty special, but I got the wind up to such a frightful extent over the ghastly situation in which young Bingo had landed me that its deeper meaning never really penetrated. Most of the time I might have been eating sawdust for all the good it did me. Old Little struck the literary note right from the start. My nephew has probably told you that I've been making a close study of your books of late, he began. Yes, he did mention it. How, uh, how did you like the ballet things? He gazed reverently at me. Mr. Worcester, I am not ashamed to say that the tears came into my eyes as I listened to them. It amazes me that a man as young as you have been able to plumb human nature so surely to its depths, to play with so unerring a hand on the quivering heartstrings of your reader, to write novels so true, so human, so moving, so vital. Oh, it's just a knack, I said. The good old purse was bedewing my forehead by this time in a pretty lavish manner. I don't know when I've been so rattled. Do you find the room a trifle warm? Oh, oh no, no, rather not. Just right. Then it's the pepper. If my cook has a fault, which I am not prepared to admit, that is that she is inclined to stress the pepper a trifle in her made dishes. By the way, do you like her cooking? I was so relieved that we had got off the subject of my literary output that I shouted approval in a ringing baritone. I'm delighted to hear it, Mr. Worcester. I may be prejudiced, but to my mind, that woman is a genius. Absolutely, I said. She has been with me seven years, and in all that time I have not known her guilty of a single lapse from the highest standard, except once in the winter of 1917, when a purist might have condemned a certain mayonnaise of hers as lacking in creaminess. But one must make allowances. There had been several air raids about that time, and no doubt the poor woman was shaken. But nothing is perfect in this world, Mr. Worcester, and I have had my cross to bear. For seven years I have lived in constant apprehension lest some evilly disposed person might lure her from my employment. To my certain knowledge, she has received offers, lucrative offers, to accept service elsewhere. You may judge of my dismay, Mr. Worcester, when only this morning the bolt fell. She gave notice. Good Lord. Your consternation does credit, if I may say so, to the heart of the author of A Red, Red Summer Rose. But I am thankful to say the worst has not happened. The matter has been adjusted. Jane is not leaving me. Good egg. Good egg indeed, though the expression is not familiar to me. I do not remember having come across it in your books. And speaking of your books, may I say that what has impressed me about them even more than the moving poignancy of the actual narrative is your philosophy of life. If there were more men like you, Mr. Worcester, London would be a better place. This was dead opposite to my Aunt Agatha's philosophy of life, she having always rather given me to understand that it is the presence in it of chappies like me that make London more or less of a plague spot. But I let it go. Let me tell you, Mr. Worcester, that I appreciate your splendid defiance of the outworn fetishes of the purblind social system. I appreciate it. You are big enough to see that rank is but the guinea stamp and that, in the magnificent words of Lord Bletchmore in Only a Factory Girl, be her origin ne'er so humble, a good woman is the equal of the finest lady on earth. I sat up. I say, do you think that? I do, Mr. Worcester. I am ashamed to say that there was a time when I was like other men, a slave to the idiotic convention which we call class distinction. But since I read your books, I might have known it. Jeeves had done it again. You think it's all right, then, for a chappie in what you might call a certain social position to marry a girl of what you might describe as the lower classes? Most assuredly I do, Mr. Worcester. I took a deep breath and slipped him the good news. Young Bingo, your nephew, you know, wants to marry a waitress, I said. I honor him for it, said Old Little. You don't object? On the contrary. I took another deep breath and shifted to the sordid side of the business. I hope you won't think I'm butting in, don't you know, I said, but, er, uh, well, how about it? I fear I do not quite follow you. Well, I mean to say, his allowance and all that, the money you're good enough to give him. He was rather hoping you might see your way to jerking up the total a bit. Old Little shook his head regretfully. 
I fear that can hardly be managed. You see, a man in my position is compelled to save every penny. I will gladly continue my nephew's existing allowance, but beyond that I cannot go. It would not be fair to my wife. What? But you're not married. Not yet. But I propose to enter upon that holy state almost immediately. The lady who for years has cooked so well for me honored me by accepting my hand this very morning. A cold gleam of triumph came into his eye. Now let him try to get her away from me, he muttered defiantly. A young Mr. Little has been trying frequently during the afternoon to reach you on the telephone, sir, said Jeeves that night when I got home. I'll bet he has, I said. I had sent poor old Bingo an outline of the situation by messenger boy shortly after lunch. He seemed a trifle agitated. I don't wonder. Jeeves, I said, brace up and bite the bullet. I'm afraid I've bad news for you. That scheme of yours, reading those books to old Mr. Little and all that, has blown a fuse. They did not soften him? They did. That's the whole bally trouble, Jeeves. I'm sorry to say that fiancé of yours, Miss Watson, you know, the cook, you know. Well, the long and the short of it is she's chosen riches instead of honest worth, if you know what I mean. Sir? She's handed you the mitten and gone and gotten engaged to old Mr. Little. Indeed, sir. You don't seem much upset. The fact is, sir, I had anticipated some such outcome. I stared at him. Then what on earth did you suggest the scheme for? To tell you the truth, sir, I was not wholly averse from a severance of my relations with Miss Watson. In fact, I greatly desired it. I respect Miss Watson exceedingly, but I've seen for a long time that we were not suited. Now, the other young person with whom I have an understanding... Great Scott, Jeeves, there isn't another. Yes, sir. How long has this been going on? For some weeks, sir. I was greatly attracted by her when I first met her at a subscription dance at Camberwell. My sainted aunt, not... Jeeves nodded his head gravely. Yes, sir. By an odd coincidence, it is the same young person that young Mr. Little... I have placed the cigarettes on the small table. Good night, sir.